Get 60% off a Babbel subscription with a special Bizarre Beasts link. Babbel is a top language learning app that is intuitive and helps you learn by creating real-life conversations. This is neither a chandelier from the 1980s nor a chain of living Ziploc bags cursed to forever roam the seas. It's a creature called a salp. And its seemingly simple body hides a surprisingly complex life history that involves cloning itself, changing sex, and fighting climate change through the power of poop. And despite looking like a jellyfish, salps are actually more closely related to us. If you want to support the channel, the Bizarre Beasts Pin Club is open for subscriptions for the whole month. Sign up by September 20th, and the first pin you will get will be these squishy sea weirdos. And if you stick around at the end of the video, you can get some bonus salp facts. Salps are tunicates, or sea squirts, and they are a type of marine zooplankton that can be found throughout the world, with especially high concentrations in the Southern Ocean. That's the ocean around Antarctica. They use jet propulsion to move, sucking water in from the front and squirting it out the back with better energy efficiency than any other jet-propelled animals that we know of. Part of what makes their method of movement so effective is the fact that as they swim, they use the water passing through them to continuously filter feed. They're just constantly eating as they move. Salps can be anywhere from 1 to 20 centimeters long, and they indiscriminately eat anything from the size of bacteria up to larval crustaceans, which is a pretty big size range. They also have a complete digestive system, meaning that food goes in one end and the waste comes out the other. This feature brings up a very important point. Despite appearances, salps are not jellyfish. The lack of tentacles might also have been a giveaway, but salps have an even more important difference from jellyfish. They have a proper brain and nervous system at least for a little while. Salps belong to a phylum of animals called chordata, which includes vertebrates like us. The most important feature of a chordate is the presence of what's called the notochord during at least some part of the life cycle. A notochord is a somewhat rigid structure that runs the length of an animal's body, giving it support as it moves. In their larval stage, salps look kind of like tadpoles, and they have that notochord running the length of their bodies. But when they mature, they reabsorb their notochord and their brain into their growing body. Despite this weirdness, salps and other tunicates are some of our closest invertebrate relatives. And having a brain as a baby and then losing it as an adult isn't even the strangest part of the salp life cycle. Salps begin their adult life as asexual, solitary individuals swim-eating wherever they go. When food becomes especially abundant, they take advantage of the bounty by rapidly producing many clones of themselves, all linked together in cool shapes. The linked clone chains can be multiple meters long, and the resulting salp swarms can cover thousands of square kilometers. The aggregation of clones starts out female, each with one egg that can be fertilized by older salps that have become male. When that one egg hatches, the larval salp develops inside of the mother, which pretty soon becomes the father, and goes on to fertilize the eggs of younger salp aggregations that are still in their female stage. The mature offspring are released to do their own thing, and when they come across a large enough food source, they'll each clone themselves and start the process all over again. This cycle of sex changes throughout their life is known as sequential hermaphroditism, and it's a phenomenon that occurs in plenty of other animals as well. They just don't all have the ability to also clone themselves like salps do. So. Why go through all that trouble? How did these tubes of sentient plastic wrap end up with such an odd, multi-stage reproductive cycle? Well, as in most evolutionary stories, it all comes down to the salps' specific niche. Because they live in the open ocean and eat whatever tiny morsels they can find, they're largely at the mercy of how abundant their food sources are. Long period without much to eat? They'll just keep on keeping on, with no hurry to reproduce. Great big phytoplankton bloom? Time for a salp bloom. They're efficiency at filter feeding and their ability to filter such a wide size range of food sources gives them a major competitive edge against other zooplankton. From there, asexual reproduction lets them react immediately to the food source and ensure that more salps will get to eat it than anyone else, while sequential hermaphroditism guarantees that they keep a healthy gene pool instead of only cloning themselves. And with both of these reproductive methods, the salp has yet another trick up its sleeve, which I guess is just like its 
its whole body. They can grow really fast. A newly hatched salp larva can grow to full maturity in 48 hours, growing at a rate of 10% of its body length per hour. That might make them the world's fastest growing animal. So how effective is all of this at helping salps dominate a phytoplankton bloom? Well, at least one recorded salp swarm covered more than 11,000 square kilometers. That's like a little less than two Delawares. Like any species that has lasted the test of time, salps simply follow the tried and true strategy of reproduce more than the competition. They just happen to do it in an especially big and weird way. With all of this eating, growing, and reproducing, you might also guess that there's a lot of pooping. And this is important. Because of how quickly salps can turn phytoplankton into both waste and more salps, they can be disproportionately effective carbon sinks. Phytoplankton that photosynthesize at the ocean's surface pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and salps then eat those phytoplankton at an incredible rate. Many salps undergo dial vertical migration, a behavior of moving down and up in the water column throughout the day to avoid predators. They can migrate hundreds of meters, carrying the carbon they ate at the surface down to the deeper layers of the ocean. Cooler still, their nutrient-rich poop is extra dense and slow to break down, causing it to sink faster and deeper than other animals' waste, thus depositing the carbon all the way at the bottom of the ocean. Their bodies have a similar effect when they die and sink, too. As a result, all of these byproducts of salp success above provide an amazing food source for animals below. Not only does this benefit bottom feeders for sometimes months at a time, but it effectively locks away what was atmospheric carbon carbon dioxide on the ocean floor. In our episode on European anchovies, we talked about how oceanographer Walter Munk came up with the theory of biomixing, animals helping move nutrients, oxygen, etc., between ocean layers, and how he did that at least partly as a joke. Tides and waves probably do most of the ocean mixing that we observe, he argued. But maybe animals also contribute? To really drive the joke part home, he speculated about the possibility of zooplankton eating phytoplankton than pooping after migrating to other depths. And now, here we are most of a century later observing that exact thing really happening, and it contributing in a very measurable way to the fight against climate change. We're only recently coming to fully understand and appreciate just how big of a role salps play in the ocean's biological carbon pump. But in the example earlier of that 11,000 square kilometer salp swarm, every day saw a removal of atmospheric carbon equal to taking 7,500 cars off the road. That's a pretty significant impact for a bunch of swimming goo blobs. Lots of phytoplankton means lots of salps making lots more salps in their very special salp way, which means supporting a whole seafloor ecosystem for a long while afterward. And this whole process may be helping us to save the world, all thanks to just how specifically bizarre this marine beast is. Sign up for the Pin Club at BizarreBeastShow.com to keep this channel going. We're doing some R&D with a new idea for how the salp pin is going to work. The salps will actually be transparent. We're not entirely sure how this is going to work, but I think it's going to look really good. And if you want the salp pin to be your first pin, subscribe by September 20th. We're working with some incredible artists for the rest of the year's pins. You don't want to miss them. And now, here are some bonus facts. I mentioned earlier in the video that salps can eat a pretty huge range of sizes of sea creatures, but they do not eat fish, even if it sometimes looks like they do. And that's because some baby fish are small enough to swim inside of a salp and just like hang out in there. The salp essentially becomes a transparent bubble of protection for these tiny fish, like a gelatinous little submarine. Unfortunately for salps, baby fish are not the only critters interested in riding a salp through the sea. One genus of parasitoid crustaceans called amphipods also like to make their home inside of salps, and they are a lot less benign than the fish. Instead of just going for a ride, the amphipods will scrape out and consume most of the salps' insides, leaving a weird empty shell behind with just enough tissue left to hold its shape and float. Females will then lay their eggs inside of the salps' body, climb back out, and drive the dead salp full of eggs around like the most cursed baby stroller. And this next bonus fact might be even weirder. I did not think that salps would be capable of causing problems. How can a brainless gelatinous tube really do anything? Well, back in 2021, salps actually shut down two of the reactors at one of South Korea's nuclear power plants. Their gooey bodies apparently clogged up the cooling systems twice in a single month. We couldn't find any news reports of this happening since then, so possibly that was just a really great salp month. Who knows? 
The life of a salp is one of constant change, from their size and shape to their sex. But when we want to start a new chapter of our lives, one of the best ways to do it is to learn a new language. And that's where this episode's sponsor, Babbel, comes in. Whether you want to plan a trip and explore new cultures, connect with loved ones in their language, or simply learn something new, challenge yourself, and connect with the world, Babbel can help. Their lessons prepare you to have practical conversations about travel, business, relationships, and more. Babbel takes on the role of a personal language coach, guiding learners towards real-life conversations in their target language. Babbel teaches more than just vocab words. It teaches you about that language's culture, people, history, and more. And their lessons are created by more than 650 real language experts, so you learn practical, real-world conversations in no time. As a Bizarre Beast viewer, you'll get up to 60% off when you sign up using the link in the description. Plus, Babbel comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee, so you can see where Babbel takes you on our language learning journey. 